come Gentlemen, before the jury. Let's go back to courtroom 5D. We're ready for the second half of the day. The second half of the day. Yes to any of them. Please raise your hand. During the lunch recess, did any of you have any discussions amongst yourselves or with anybody else about the case? No hands are being raised. Did any of you <clears throat> read or listen to any um, radio, television, or newspaper reports about the case? No hands are being raised. Did any of you use any type of an electronic device to get on the internet to do any independent research about the case, people, places, things, or terminology? Thank you. No hands are being raised. And finally, did any of you read or create any emails, text messages, tweets, social networking pages, or blogs about the case? No hands are being raised. Thank you very much. Mr. De La, La Rionda, you may inquire. Okay, please support. Good afternoon, Doctor. Good afternoon. You've got, you've got a loud voice like I do, so hopefully we'll be able to hear each other. Okay. We also share another thing in common. <laughs> <laughs> now, Doctor, you're not saying, you're not testifying here as to who started what led up to the death of Trayvon Martin. That's correct, sir. And you're not saying as to who attacked who, whether it was George Zimmerman who attacked uh, Trayvon Martin or whether it was Trayvon Martin who attacked George Zimmerman. You can't say it to that, correct? That's correct, sir. In <coughs> fact, you can't testify as to who threw the first punch. That's correct, sir. In fact, you can't really testify whether there was a first punch thrown. That's correct, sir. And you can't say whether it was Trayvon Martin defending himself or uh, George Zimmerman defending himself in terms of when this first started. When it first started, that's correct, sir. Your really testimony is only focusing on, on at the time of the actual shot, correct? Would that that's, be accurate? That's correct, sir. Okay. And you're not stating here, are you, that Everything George Zimmerman stated at the statement you saw, the reenactment, right. is the complete gospel truth. That's correct, sir. I'm just stating um, the nature of the gunshot wound, uh, being consistent with his account of how he shot. Right. But were you aware, sir, that the defendant had given one, two, three, I believe at least four, maybe five statements prior to that one? I believe you had mentioned that to me, sir. I think I mentioned that in your deposition, right? Yes, sir. Now, is there, only, is there a reason why you only focused on the reenactment as opposed to the original statement that he gave? Well, because I know what the reenactment said, and essentially he's holding to that account. And so what I'm saying is, is that what I did was I uh, evaluated the objective evidence in regards to this account that's being presented here. Uh, okay. I apologize. I interrupted you. Were you finished? No, no, no. That's fine. Thank you. Let me know if I ever interrupt you. I apologize. And I okay. also told the court reporter that I would be slow. And so if you can do the same thing, she needs to get everything down. Um, when, we're, when we're talking to each other, make sure we don't talk over each other. Um, yes, sir. Am I correct in stating that you've always believed that the first statement is the most accurate statement? The, the first statement is usually more accurate than when given weeks or months later. Oh, okay. Uh, because you get that in depositions, you know. I got you. Um, now, you mentioned your prior, prior experience with the medical examiners. You were head of the medical examiner's office in that beautiful city, San Antonio. That's correct, sir. That, uh, in fact, when you go to the Alamo and right near there, you can go down and go actually to the water. You go down to what about, I don't know how deep, how far you go down, but you go down somewhat. It's about two levels down. You're on the river walk, right? Okay. All right. Now, you mentioned that when you worked there uh, for, what, 15, 20 years, I think? Uh, 25 years and 10 months. Okay. Didn't mean to cut it short. Hmm. Um, you mentioned you, as a medical examiner, it was important for you, was it not? To, before you render an opinion, to make sure you understood all the facts, correct? Depends upon the case. You know, some cases you want more information, some cases it's not necessary. It just depends on, everything's personal. Right. But I guess what I'm saying is when police would bring you a case, the medical examiner, and obviously they bring you the body, right. and you start doing the autopsy, you'd want to know what all the witnesses said. You wouldn't just pick one witness and say, okay, what did you say? 
you would want to know what everybody else said to make sure it was consistent with the evidence that you saw, correct? In, in most cases, yes, sir. Okay. Now, in this particular case, you just focused on the defendant's statement, and I believe you said Mr. Good's statement, correct? What I, okay, I focused on the, the defendant's statement because that's, as you pointed out earlier in your cross-examination, that's all that I'm concentrating on, whether it's, uh, so uh, I went to see is if his statement was consistent right. with what I found, right. or what was found as the, the gunshot wounds. The rest, I can't say. Right, because you were provided with all the other statements of all the other witnesses, correct? But again, I couldn't say what they, what they, I would have to disregard them in regards to the gunshot wound. Okay. Because the only one present there is Mr. Zimmerman. So you have to go by what he's saying. Well, I, I, I respectfully beg to differ with you. There was another person there, wasn't there? Well, there were, uh, there were a couple other witnesses, yes. Sir. No, I, I mean, respectfully, the other person there is not, not among us anymore. Right, That's okay. because he's the only one who communicates. That's right. correct. He can't speak because he's dead. Yeah. Okay. Were you aware, by the, by the way, that the deceased... The victim in this case, Trayvon Martin, was on the phone with a lady? Yes, sir. You didn't review her statement, did you? No, sir. But when you worked with the medical examiner's office as the chief medical examiner, you, in most cases, attempted to find out all the information before you came to an opinion. It depends on what the case is about. Often the information from the witnesses it goes more towards the manner of death rather than the cause of death. And in this case, there's no question what the manner of death is. Okay. And um, so are you suggesting that then all the witnesses' testimony should just be disregarded? For my purpose, not for the jury, but okay. for my purposes, it's not important in my giving my opinion. In, in terms of your limited opinion as to the gunshot wound itself, in terms of how it possibly could have occurred. Right. Is it, that correct? Right. The other statements are for the jury to evaluate, not for me. Okay. So you, you're not saying that, the, that we should just disregard what led up to this, whether somebody was following or whether somebody was attacking somebody. You're not saying that that should be disregarded. That, that's not right. That's not what I'm doing. The rest of that is the jury. That's why they're sitting there. Okay, okay. Right. I, I didn't mean to imply that, that you were saying that. I just wanted to oh. make sure the record was clear about oh, that. Oh, no. Oh, that's no problem. Okay. And Mr. West asked you uh, a few what we refer to as hypotheticals. What if, assuming this fact, and in order to give an opinion when somebody gives you an a, a hypothetical, it has to be based on facts that are accurate and truthful, correct? Oh, a hypothetical doesn't have to be true. Oh, okay. A hypothetical is just suppose this and this happened. Okay, so we would be speculating, I guess, or potentially speculating. Well, it's not even speculating. You're just giving a presentation and you're asking what it is. So it doesn't even get to the speculating. Okay. And, and you would agree that at least the one statement that you relied on, which I think was either the fourth or fifth statement that Mr. Zimmerman had given, the reenactment, that Mr. Zimmerman has a self-interest, correct, when he's talking to the police? Yes, sir. And one could even argue that he has a bias in not telling the truth. One could argue that. I think that's your argument. <laughs> yes, sir. And you would also agree that if his statement doesn't match the evidence, then it's not the truth, correct? That's correct, sir. And I guess in your, what you reviewed, you were aware, were you not, that the only person that was armed out there was George Zimmerman and not Trayvon Martin? Yes, sir. Okay. Were you aware that he wasn't just armed with a firearm, but that he was also armed with a flashlight? Yes, sir. Actually, there's a photograph of the flashlight in uh, the same photos. May I have a person witness, John? He has a big flashlight. This right here? Yes, sir. Did this do some damage to somebody? Did 
Yeah. Uh, I apologize. May I approach the witness? You may. Well, it's not a good. I thought it was one of these old steel heavy things. I wouldn't consider it a really dangerous whip. Do you, you think it's all right to hit somebody like that real hard and it wouldn't cause any bruising? I think it might cause a bruise, but it's just not heavy enough to, okay. to be of significant. So you were not provided with a statement of um, George Zimmerman on top of Trayvon Martin before the shooting? I was not provided with that statement. That's correct, sir. You were not provided with a statement of Celine Bahador, were you? No, sir. And you mentioned you were provided with a statement of John Good. I think you stated originally the... Uh, a, an audio recorded statement and a written statement he gave, correct? Yes, sir. Were you aware that he gave also an additional sworn statement in which he described not hearing this at all? Um, no, sir. I don't think so. Were you aware that he also stated under oath that he did not hear anything concrete at all? No, sir. I'm trying to do this chronologically, but I want to go back. Yes. I don't want to. Uh, I want to go back a little bit about your, your CV and your qualifications that uh, Mr. West talked about uh, in terms of where you've been and that kind of stuff. You mentioned that. Um, I was curious. You mentioned something about shooting animals. <coughs> now, are we saying that this experiment was done while the animals were alive? Following federal regulations, yes. What you have to do is the animals have to be kept in a federally approved uh, area, and then uh, a veterinarian has to be present at the time of the uh, experiments, and the animals have to be anesthetized. Okay, and so then you, it's what, you started shoot, just started shooting at them, or how many how many shot how many times were they shot? I'd have to read the paper originally, but. Uh, um, you know, it was a, a test to determine the uh, whether the uh, testing method used by firearms examiners was valid. And, and, and you determined that it was, correct? Yes, sir, it was. Okay. You also mentioned that you've testified all over the, the world, really, I guess, or part of the world. A couple of places, yes. Okay. And you testified in, in criminal matters, both for the government or the state and also for the defense, correct? Yes, sir. And in fact, you were asked about several cases that you had testified on, uh, on behalf of. I think you testified in the, um, and you were nice enough to, to send me and, and Mr. West your um, list of your cases, at least within the last five years since you've been in private practice. Or is it seven years? Or not? Uh, it's six going on seven now. Okay. And I think you said, what, over 50 times or so, or do you recall the number? No, I don't think I said a number uh, how many uh, times I've testified. But again, as I pointed out, most of them are civil cases. Right, and I think one of them you made the uh, Drew Peterson case, right? That was a criminal case, yeah. Yeah, and then also the uh, P uh, Spectre case, too, I think, right? Yes, sir. Um, and in both of those cases, you testified for the defense, defense right? Yes, By the way, uh, how much are you getting here today? Same thing I charge everybody, $400 an hour. And how much total have you charged so far? I know you got to take a trip back, but... Uh, okay, up to uh, yesterday, $2,400. It's, it's, this is not exactly a complicated case forensically. Okay. Um, You mentioned that, uh, I think you brought your notes with you, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah, I guess most experts have their notes just to, if something is asked, just, do you, what do you use it for, just to refresh your memory? It's, it, it, no, it, because if you get a whole bunch of papers, 
And you only are interested in one fact. It's easier to just to put the fact down. That's all. So they're like little cheat notes. I'm not saying anything improper. No, I, I saying, know what you mean. Right? Just like little bullets type things so you would be able to answer something or? Right. Bullets. And, and I think you prepared, what, a five or six page of notes that you provided to me this morning and to Mr. West? Uh, yeah, five pages. Well, it's five pages, but it's double spaced, double sided in some, so it's probably closer to 10. No, eight, maybe, something like okay. that. Okay. And I think you also mentioned as part of your uh, <coughs> review of this case, obviously you couldn't be there when the autopsy was done, so you actually reviewed the autopsy report, correct? Oh, yes, yes. And, and your opinion is, is in part uh, derived from reviewing Dr. Bow's medical examiner report, correct? That's correct, sir. In terms of, obviously, the photographs that were taken, but in terms of his findings, you know, shot to the heart, correct? Right, sir. There is no dispute about that, that the deceased, the victim in this case, Trayvon Martin, was shot in the, in the heart. That's correct, sir. Okay. Now, did I understand you correctly that if you came over here and you pulled my heart out, that I could sit there and walk and talk for how long? 15, oh, well, 10 to 15 seconds, yes. Okay, so if you pulled my heart out now, I could keep talking and just keep talking and talking and talking <laughs> for, and just talking and talking and talking without a heart. That's right. Okay, for and about 15 it, seconds or so? Right. It's uh, between 10 and 15 seconds. It's dependent on the oxygen supply. To the head, and that's why some of the SWAT people will prefer shooting somebody in the head right. if it's a situation where the person is has like a gun on somebody else. Okay. Now, even though my heart is gone, I would still feel some pain, or would I not? Oh, uh, yeah, you would still feel pain, but uh, right. Now, I think you stated that um, in this case, you believe it was. 12 to 15, or what did you say, 10 to 6, 15 seconds, or 5 to... No. What I said is I can't say. Okay. All I can say is that the minimum amount of time would be between 10 and 15 seconds. Okay. And you said the maximum would be up to 3 minutes, did I get that right? Well, I said that in all medical probability, the individual would have no cardiac function after, <clears throat> after I said 1 to 3 minutes, so 3 minutes is the outside. And by the way, you're not here to testify as to, while this was going on, who was yelling for help, whether it was the victim or George Zierman. You can't say it, right? No, sir. I'm not testifying to that. That's correct. And in fact, you can't testify as to one of the statements that George Zierman said where he said he pulled the gun from his holster and shot. You can't say that that happened that way, correct? Oh, you mean that he pulled the gun out of the holster? Yes, sir. Right. I can just say that uh, the injuries are consistent with how he shot him, but not how where he got the gun from. Right. In terms of the shot being to the chest. Right. Okay. But in terms of how he claims that he, he grabbed the gun while the other person is kneeling over him or straddling him, how he managed to somehow get the gun out and shoot the other person, you can't say that that happened that way or not. No, because that's before, but because you can't tell that by any scientific method. But, but George Zimmerman said it happened that way. That doesn't mean it's true, right? As I said, sir, I can't testify to it, so that's it. Okay. Now, what happens if it was just physically impossible to do what he said happened? I would say it. But you didn't get a chance to review that, and you're not here to testify about whether he took the gun out of the holster the way he did or not. Right, because it's, it's outside my ability to make a conclusion like that. Right, okay. You're just here focusing on the gun and how close it was to the skin or to the sweatshirt, correct? That's correct, I mean, sir. that's the bottom line. In regard to Mr. Martin, that is, yes, sir. Okay. Now, is it not true, sir, that one possibility, as you stated, is Mr. Martin was over George Zimmerman, the defendant, and he was like this, right? George Zimmerman was down on the ground, and Mr. Martin's like this on top of him. Well, he'd, he'd be some way over him. I don't know what angle it is. Well, is it this angle? Oh, I can't tell you. 
The and reason is, is because if you put your hand out, since it rotates, if someone was over horizontally, you could shoot that way. If they were at an angle, you could shoot that way, and you still get the path. All that I can say is consistent with him being over. And it also could be consistent that they were facing each other, standing up. You asked me that question once before, and I position. said, the problem with that is the shirt would hang down. You'd have to grab the shirt with the other hand, and then pull, uh, grab the shirt and like pull it away this way. But the problem with that is if you then shot through the shirt in that area, when the shirt is let go and put back in position, the wound, because of that, moves over to the side. So the defect in the shirt would be over here if it was pulled this way. Because if you hold your finger on the shirt right here, and then if you pull the shirt this way, you've moved it to, the, to where it would be overlying the gunshot to get it away from the chest. So you're saying that Trayvon Martin had to physically be on top like this? I'm saying that the uh, physical evidence is consistent with uh, Mr. Martin being over Mr. Zimmerman. And is it not also consistent with Mr. Martin pulling away from Zimmerman on the ground and you would have the same angle, he's pulling away and Zimmerman shooting him at that time? Yes. Right? I think you said yes. Yes, I did. Okay, I apologize. That's all right. I told you I was a little bit hard of hearing. I want to make sure. Well, that should be interesting since both of us seem to be that, so. <laughs> I was going to ask you what ear, but that, that anyway. Um, the other question I had is in terms of, of possibilities, you mentioned blunt trauma, and I'm talking now about, I'm switching a minute, to George Zierman's head, the defendant's head. Right. In terms of that would be concrete, it's a possibility, correct? Right. Or maybe like a tree branch, that's a possibility for any of those bruises? If, if you hit someone in the back of the head with a tree branch. Or yes. if you bump into it? Uh, where? The face or the back of the head? Either one. Um, the problem with tree branches are, if you hit it in the face, they're rough and you would expect an abrasion. Well, didn't he have an abrasion on the face? No, he doesn't have abrasions, don't forget. He, he, what did he have on the that, face? That's, that's a contusion up there. The skin, if the skin is smooth and shiny, an abrasion is a scrape, like you fall on your knee and scrape. Did he yeah. have any abrasions at all? He, yes, he did. Okay, he I'm had. Sorry. Okay. Go ahead. No, no. Finish, please. I interrupted you. I'm sorry. He had a small abrasion on the right side of the nose, and then he had impact type abrasions on the right area, of the temple, the left temple, and then in the back he had the two lacerations. So I'm struggling with you. We're wrestling. We're doing all that, and then I push you, and you hit the tree. Isn't that? Couldn't that have been caused that way? From the front. From Not the back. Whatever. Well, you'd have to have a tree branch there, and I didn't see any. You did? But, but, but wait a minute. But the other thing is, is if you just bump your head in, uh, wood gives. Originally, police officers carried wooden batons. And the reason they carried the wooden batons were they're much less dangerous than metal things. Metals don't give. Wood gives. And so, I mean, if you hit someone hard enough on the back of the head, yes, you're going to get a laceration. You know, I, I try to simplify things as best I can when it comes to medical stuff. You do any gardening at all? No, my wife does. Okay. I do gardening, and I've got a bald head, and if I don't wear a ball cap sometimes, I'll come up and I'll hit my head, and there'll be a bruise or something Yeah, a tree branch. Isn't that possible? An abrasion. I said there are abrasions back here, but what I'm saying is... Um, whatever. <laughs> okay. Now I've lost my chain of thought. But. Yes, sir. Um, you weren't aware, and I'm showing you, Dr. DeMaio, that there was trees out there where at some point 
Even the defendant acknowledges that there was a struggle of some type near that, those trees. My understanding of what you were saying was the trees were on the ground, not the... Oh, I apologize. I'm talking so about I a know, live tree. I saw the pictures and I saw the vertical trees, right, yeah. So, thank you, Your Honor. I think I'll... So that's a possibility, correct? For some, at least some of the uh, bruising You uh, could have one of the injuries due to bumping against a tree. That's correct, sir. Okay. And also, uh, some of the injuries that uh, <coughs> you described to the defendant, George Zierman, could be just from rolling around, and the, both of them rolling on the concrete, hitting the concrete as they're struggling or fighting. Impact on the concrete. That's what I'm saying. Yes. Right. I mean, that's consistent with what you're saying. Impact yes, on the concrete. Is yes. that correct? I was curious what you mentioned about um, Trayvon Martin that you mentioned you described the injury to his left hand. The, the I think, what did you call it? A, uh, or what did Dr. Bow call it, I should say, because I know you got to rely the, on him, but. Abrasion to the you were, you were uh, You were agreeing with that assessment, correct? Well, he called it, so I have to go with it. Well, you saw the photograph, didn't you? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm not sure if I did or not. Okay. Well, let's assume I, I can show it to you if you want or. Mark ahead. I'm listening to you. Okay. And assuming that's an abrasion, you believe that there may be additional injuries under his knuckles, I think you said? No. Those are two separate questions. Okay. One question was whether it's an abrasion. And I said, you know, I don't have, I can't disagree with the individual who did the autopsy. But I said, the next question was, is if you keep, if you punch somebody, will you get, um, bruises on your knuckles? And my answer was yes and no. So or, you might, you might not. You might or you might not. If you really suspect something, they should have made a cut into the hand and then examined underneath. And I gather if the person's still alive, you're not going to say, hey, let me take, let me cut all your knuckles, right? Right. But, but what happened to the person's alive, you just sit there and wait a day or so, and then you'll know whether there's any hemorrhage. But didn't you say sometimes you can hit something and not have any hemorrhaging at all? Right. That, the problem, what I'm saying is, you can get it or you cannot. And okay. if you have it, it, and you live a couple of days, you'll be able to see it. But the thing is, is if it's not there, it's not important. I, I, I think, let me make sure I understand what you're saying. That you can hit somebody and not leave any bruising on your on your on your on your knuckles, correct? That's correct, sir. In other words, George Zimmerman could have hit Trayvon Martin and not left any bruising on his on his knuckles. That's correct, sir. You were asked a bunch of questions, and I think you were showing some photographs of um, George Zimmerman's head, right? Yes. All sir. parts of his head, and you gave your opinion as to what that is or not, correct? Yes, sir. Would you not agree, sir, that somebody who's familiar with his head, like uh, a doctor that had treated him in the past, or like a physician's assistant would know what's existing there before that day and not in terms of what the shape of the body or the head is? May or may not. Okay. I mean, you know, you don't re generally remember the shape of a, one of your patient's head, especially if you're seeing 20 or 30 patients a day. So. Well, my next question regarding that, what do you agree that that would be the best person that would see George Zimmerman alive right then and there what's happening the next day would be able to describe what injuries he had or did not have? In theory, if they do it correctly, yes. The problem is, is that emergency room records and doctor's records are generally lousy in regards to describing injuries. Very, very lousy. Well, you agree that the fire rescue people are, do an honorable job in the sense that they know what they're doing, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, right? I'm not saying these people aren't, aren't competent, but their job is to treat patients, and they have a tendency not to document what they see. And that's why they want to put forensic nurses in emergency rooms to document these injuries, because doctors aren't interested in the injuries. They're interested in treating the patient. Sure, but but the fire rescue people are interested in, in injuries, aren't they? They're interested, just like doctors, in treating a person. The uh, Because like if you read the, the records, they mention two lacerations. They don't even say wh where they are, except in the back of the head. 
Well, Ms. Folgate actually measured it for you, and that's why you were able to detail exactly how little they were. Right. Well, 20 millimeters and 5 millimeters. But then they didn't say which one was on the right side, which one was on the left side, or, or located exactly. So, you know. Now, you could tell, couldn't you, when you looked at the photograph? <laughs> yes, but they didn't do it. Okay. And, and I couldn't tell which one was the 20 and which one was the 5 because, there was, because the wound hadn't cleaned up when they took the photograph. Well, are we talking about the same photograph? The, there were two photographs, remember? Uh, the better one on the back of the head, there was still blood there, and you couldn't really tell which one was the 20 millimeter, which was the 5, because one of them had clotted blood on top of it. Now, you do agree with the treatment in the sense of uh, it didn't need any stitches, right? I agree, but, but actually my answer should be it's outside my area of expertise. Okay, so because you're not treatment. quibbling with that, right? But yeah, but I will agree that uh, they didn't need treatment. You're really, you're sticking to your main thing is gunshot wounds, correct? Well, I'm describing blunt force injuries. You're asking me about treatment, which is different. I'm sorry, I, I don't. You asked me about treatment, and I don't treat people. Okay. You deal with them after they're dead. Yes, sir. Right? Yes, sir. Okay. But you did review the fire rescue report regarding the treatment of George Zierman, correct? Yes, sir. And uh, when it says the patient has a GCS of 15, what does that mean? Oh, that's the Glasgow uh, index thing. And what and does that indicate to you, sir? Oh, it means that uh, he's perfectly fine. Oh, everybody here has a 15. So in this room would be a 15. So. And those are the fire rescue people that dealt with him right after this interaction between the defendant and Trayvon Martin. That's correct. Correct? Sir. Yes. Now, did I understand you correctly that you're saying that the difference between the photograph at the scene, that bloody photograph that he's got, do you have that big one by any chance? I know we've got it in evidence, but I believe the defense has got a big one. Thank you, sir. The, the, the front of the middle. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. You're saying this one right here, that there's a difference between, I apologize, Your Honor, may I approach the witness? This big photograph uh, that shows the front of the defendant's face, it's got some blood on it, that was taken by the police out there, right? You remember seeing that? Yes, sir. Okay, you're saying that you believe there was something wrong with his nose, the right part of his nose, correct? Yeah, yes, sir. If you look at the photograph taken about uh, four hours later, that marked deviation of the side of the nose is not there. It's disappeared. And <coughs> do you need something to drink? Or? No, no. And your, your opinion is that you believe the fire rescue people just did it without them noticing that they did it or the, de the defendant, George Zimmerman, realizing that they had put his nose back in place, correct? It's a simple, if it's a simple, I said it's consistent with the fracture. Since no one, the EMS thought there was a fracture. They said that. And if it's a fracture and it's now replaced, that would account for the differences in the photographs. Because you agree that four hours later, his nose is perfect. It, it's not swollen to the right side. That's a, uh, well, it's still swollen a little on the right side, but it's not as deviated as shown in the first photograph. And it's possible that it wasn't fractured at all. But then the swelling should still be there, which it wasn't four hours later. Well, did you know whether they, they gave him something to put on there to, to, to control it's, the swelling? It's not, it's not going to change. Okay. It's not going to change. Now, you also talked about the injury to the back of his head, right? The two, I think, I'm going to call them scratches. That's not the correct. Is there, are they lacerations? Lacerations. Right. Okay, and those are what? How? There were two inches and four inches, you said? Oh, no, no, no. It's 20 millimeters, which is a shade less than an inch. And the other one is five millimeters, which is about a fifth of an inch. So one is about smaller than this? Right. And then one's about about that? Correct, sir. You're not saying that those are, that he would die from those, are you, do you? Oh, no, I never said oh, that. Okay. I said it's indicative of uh, a hard impact, that's a little. Or maybe hitting a tree limb or just rolling around in the dirt and on the concrete? What a tree. 
it's it's indicative of a hard impact. That's all I see. But you don't know how, whether it was a hard impact, somebody hitting him on the thing, or him rolling around in it. It's a hard impact. That's all I can okay. say. Okay. That's all I have said. Yes, sir. Now. And you were aware that he was offered medical care in terms of take, going to see a doctor at some point, and he declined to do that. Yes, sir. Correct? Yes, sir. Now, also, I believe Ms. Fulgate and also the fire rescue did not notice any kind of other injuries to the top of his head. Do you think they just missed it? No. I, there's two possible explanations. Is one that the... Uh, the bleeding continued after he was seen by EMS. And so you're looking at something where it's been bleeding for four or five hours. Or they just didn't notice it because they didn't, they knew there was an impact, they didn't consider it significant. But he went to the, That's the EMS. facility, no, he went the next day to the facility where he ran it, where uh, physician's assistant Miss Fulgate treated him. And she didn't notate all the injuries that you're describing. Well, that's the problem that forensic pathologists pull their hair out from, is that the medical personnel just don't describe injuries properly. Okay. Which is nothing bad against them, because their job is to treat people. Our, my job is to look at injuries, you know, not treat. The other thing that I want to ask you about this is, may I approach the witness, Your uh, the photograph that was taken at the scene. Yes. I'm sorry, of the defendant. I apologize. Where he's got blood there, right? Right. Okay. I put my hand over that, right? Okay. Yes. What do you expect my hand to have on it? Blood. photograph I just showed you that I put my hand over uh, you said you would expect blood on my hand wouldn't you agree that if he was bleeding like that that the blood if he's standing the blood will go down right I'm assuming if he's bleeding from the nose it depends how profusely but eventually it'll go down right okay now if I'm laying flat on my back and I'm bleeding from my nose the blood will go inward correct Partially, partially. Right. Some will go out and some will go in. And, and, and so it will be more difficult for me to swallow or to speak, I'm assuming, if blood's coming down, correct? Depends how profusely you bleed. Sure. Right. Okay. Well, assuming I was bleeding profusely, assuming I had a bloody nose or maybe even a fractured nose and it was bloody and I'm laying down, the blood would go into my mouth, correct, eventually? Yes, sir. So it'd be harder for me to swallow, talk, etc. I'm assuming, right? Yeah, unless you just start swallowing it. Okay. Now, did I understand you correctly that you did not view the uh, video that was taken of George Zimmerman, the defendant, when he was brought to the police station, when he was being walked, and he walked fine and had no problems walking or talking? Actually, I've seen it, but <laughs> they kept playing it on TV all the time. Okay. Yeah, I mean, he seemed to be walking fine and had no problems, correct? And, and That's being correct, able to sir. communicate. That's right. And I know the recording that you saw of the defendant's interview was subsequent to that. I believe it was two days later. Yes, sir. But on that evening, right after he was in this struggle with Tray Trayvon Martin, he was walking and talking fine. Yes, sir. Okay. You're not quibbling with that, right? No, sir. And you agree that there is actually no witnesses to the actual shooting other than the person charged with the crime, George Zimmerman, and the person that's dead. That's correct. correct. Regarding the gunshot wound, and I know that that's your focus in terms of how close, I think you stated it was up to 
Four inches would be max, and then two inches, correct? And right, that somewhere right? between two and four. Okay, and when you say two inches, you are accounting for the sweatshirt underneath, and then the the um, hoodie or sweatshirt with the hood over it, correct? No. You're not, because you're saying the hole kind of creates a barrier, or right. a, a hole, I guess. Right, I'm, I'm talking between the skin and the muzzle. Okay, now, have you ever worn one of those hoodies? Those jackets, sweatshirts? Not that type, no. Okay. Do you have you seen people wearing them? Yes, sir. Don't they normally wear them a little big? Yes, sir. Okay. And don't they kind of hang down? Yes, sir. And if I if I had a if the person's wearing it hanging down and he's got something in it, wouldn't it hang down? Uh, I'll object. Car speculation outside the scope of this particular case. I don't believe I'm allowed to ask. He asked in terms of possibilities. Yes, sir. Wouldn't you agree that if, I'm, if I've got something here heavy, it's hanging down, right? Right. And that would make it a little tighter, wouldn't it? Yes, sir. about the DNA and I know at some point you were head of the lab I think it was in Texas too wasn't it yes sir okay and you were asked about the DNA and about the possible packaging or improper packaging I think you were asked about what the proper way is and what it's not correct? yes sir and uh, would you be surprised that that same um, object or piece of evidence the shirt let me backtrack a second. You're saying that the plastic would contaminate or cause mold, bacteria, and you it would, I guess, retard or degrade whatever DNA is there, correct? No. What I said was that you're supposed to dry the blood, and then you package it separately so that one piece doesn't contaminate the other, and you don't put it in a plastic bag because a plastic bag is airtight. A paper, if you put it in, wrap it in paper, then the paper kind of breathes. Sure. So if you put plastic bags on like a body and you put it in a refrigerator and then pull it out, you've got moisture all over it. Right. But what if you put the, pla you put the, the piece of clothing or the article of clothing in a bag, paper bag, and you put it in plastic or whatever way you do it, but you keep it separate, you still believe mold to get into it, right? Uh, okay. There's always... Okay, you can always get mold into it, but if it dries, the perp that's where you're drying it to prevent the bacteria and the mold. Assuming you don't dry it properly. Oh, then you'll get mold and you'll get bacteria. That's and then the, whatever de DNA de is, is gone. Right. Is that correct? Yeah, you can, you can glue some or all. Depends on how long you keep it in there. Okay. Would you be surprised if there was <clears throat> DNA found in this area that apparently was mispackaged or whatever? No. Okay. You said you did review also the firearms report, is that correct? Yes. Now, at least that was from FDLE, and you agreed with that in the sense of the, um, the findings in terms of the range and all that stuff, and the stippling or suit or gunpowder, whatever, whatever words we want to use. She just described soot and a few unburned grains of powder, right? <clears throat> Am I safe to assume that your opinion is that somehow after George Zimmerman, the defendant, was punched or whatever, rolled around, or whatever, he had an injury to his nose, that you believe it may have been fractured or at least displaced in some way, and that somebody out there at the scene put it back in place, correct? Or he did, just by pulling Oh, he could have done it himself. Sure, just by pulling I'm assuming that would have been painful. Yes, sir. Okay. And so you you believe he would have done it himself? No, I didn't say that. You asked me who could do it, and I just added it to your list. And, oh, I, I, you, you're saying anybody could have done it? Anybody could have done it. Okay. Or it, 
nobody could have done it, and it just wasn't as bad as people think. Well, the, if it's just swelling, it shouldn't have gone down in four hours. That thing is just so deviated. It, the most likely is, is that the nose is just deviated because it's been fractured. I'll talk about another subject that's close to our hearts in the sense we're bald, both, both bald-headed. Uh, in fact, I've been referred to as that bald-headed dude. I don't know if you've ever been called that before. But, uh, but my question is, when we bleed there, tell us about the bleeding. It, it, it's very profuse, isn't it? Because well, scalp bleeding is always <laughs> profuse because the scalp has a lot of blood vessels in it. More than other areas of the body, potentially? Yes, sir. And why is that? I have absolutely no idea. That's how the design is. <laughs> you know. So the bottom line, sir, there are possibilities, and one of the possibilities is what you said, and then there's other possibilities of how that gunshot wound occurred. Is that correct? To a degree. I, what I right. said was that it's consistent with what his account. Right. And you're not saying the account where he's saying he grabbed the gun and how he took it out. You're just saying when the gun is out already. That's is that correct. correct? That's correct, sir. I mean, I want to make sure the jury understands that. You're saying at the time he had the gun out already and was pointing it at the person he ended up shooting. Yes, Correct? Sir. Yes, sir. And at that point, you don't know if Trayvon Martin was backing up, backing away in terms of providing an angle or whether he was going to forward. You can't say all I said was it's consistent with his account, Mr. Zimmerman's account, that's all. But it's also consistent with Trayvon Martin pulling back in terms of providing the same angle. I, I told you that too, yes. I think I, I probably just already asked you that. You're not here testifying about the holster, how that works, or and the reason I ask is because you are, I don't want to say a firearms expert, but you are an expert regarding gunshots. You're not here about the No, sir. No, nor sir. about the firearm himself, right? Not about the firearm either, no sir. sweatshirt with a hood on it. Do you need some water or something? No, sir. Okay. Um, if the shirt's baggy, it's people are still able to grab it. In other words, it's still going to grab in terms of being bagged, right? If it's big, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. I think you testified about the fact that your expertise is once the body is dead, not while well, alive in terms of the trauma and all that. You're not an expert on that. On, on tra trauma to the head or anything like that, or are you an expert on that? No. Okay, trauma is pathology, so I, I will testify on that. I don't testify to treatment. Treatment on, on injuries to the head. Right. I don't testify to treatment at all because I don't treat people. Now, were you aware that out there at Retreat of Twin Lakes, where, in the area where this happened, that there's also, in addition to the concrete you know, walkway, there's also a sprinkler boxes? Did you see any of those in the photographs you I were providing? I didn't provided? see any of those in the photographs, no, sir. Okay, or you mentioned knuckles, too, or fist, correct? It's possibility, correct? Yes, sir. I may have a moment, Your Honor. Do you know whether George Zimmerman's right or left handed? A right handed. Thank you very much, sir. Okay.
pictures. Dr. DeMaio, the, the notes that you prepared to yes. assist you today in testimony, do they contain a summary of some of the measurements, for example? That Trayvon Martin was 5'11 feet inches and right. weighed 158 pounds. That's correct, sir, yes. That his boss, Maddie, boss body mass index would be 22, which would be right in the middle of the normal range for a person his size. That's correct, sir. For example, you would have indicated that the location of the gunshot. What's the leading nature of the question? Would you have indicated, for quick reference, where precisely the gunshot wound was on Mr. Martin's body, for example? Yes, sir, I put that down. Do you need your notes to form your opinions once you have the, the facts before you? Oh, no. no. Do your notes include several pages of the photos that you think were the most pertinent in assessing the trauma to Mr. Zimmerman? Yes, sir. Four of the pages are just photographs. Have we shown those photographs here? Yes, sir. The, the scope of your work, if you will, was to consider the statement that Mr. Zimmerman made to the police about how the um, shooting took place at the moment the shot was fired, and for you to consider the forensic evidence of that gunshot to determine whether or not Mr. Zimmerman's statement about what happened is consistent with the physical forensic evidence. Leading and compound portion. Do you understand the question? Yes. Okay, you may answer. Uh, yes, sir. To do that, is it necessary in your mind to review every witness statement uh, regardless of whether they saw the actual moment when the shot was fired? That's correct, sir. Uh, I have to um, interpret the objective evidence. I'm not going to base my opinion on the witnesses because witnesses are wrong all the time. Have you had occasion where you reviewed witness statements, people who claim to have seen some... All the... You know, they'll say they, someone stood over a man and shot him and... Uh, Two architects and a secretary said that they saw it. The only problem was is that the bullet taken from the body did not match the gun of the person who supposedly stood him over him and shot him. And the bullet that hit him was a ricochet fire that had to have been fired from 20 or 30 feet away. So that, that's one case. But I've got a half a dozen of those cases. Let's, let's talk for a moment more specifically, since Mr. Delarionda mentioned them by name. A woman named Celine Bahador testified in the trial and didn't claim to have seen the individuals at the time the shot was fired. Would that matter to you at all? No. Let's talk about Jane Serdica then, for example. Ms. Serdica testified in the trial and she said she was looking at the individuals outside her window some distance away and believes that she was looking at them when the shot was fired. What she described was that at the time the shot was fired, Mr. Zimmerman was on top of Mr. Martin. Objection and leading and mischaracterization of the facts. Can I finish my question, please? Well, if it's a mischaracterization of the facts, I need you to rephrase your question. It's not, Your Honor. Well, I guess that's for the jury to determine. So please rephrase your question. Okay, sure. Ms. Serdica said she was looking out the window and that she believes she was looking at the individuals when the shot was fired. She said that at the time the shot was fired, 
that Mr. Zimmerman was on top and that Mr. Martin was face down. Is that possible given the forensic evidence that you know in this case? No, sir, it's not possible. Mr. Martin it's wasn't... Sh he's shot in the front, so... He so would her, her, would her statement have done you any good in this case? No, sir. In fact, that would be an example of how an eyewitness, no matter how well intended, just gets it wrong. Yes, sir. You did consider John Good's statement to the extent that he was the person... Objection. It's a leading question. Sustained. John Good testified at the trial that when he looked out his back door, he saw the person later identified as George Zimmerman on his back on the ground and that he saw Trayvon Martin straddling him on his knees, um, striking Mr. Zimmerman in some sort of MMA style. And then he went back inside and some seconds later, the shot was fired. Is the position that Mr. Good saw Trayvon Martin straddling and striking Mr. Zimmerman with Mr. Zimmerman on his back consistent with the forensic evidence that you found at the time of the shot? Yes, sir. That statement, I take it, is separate and apart from Mr. Zimmerman's statement describing essentially the same thing. Right, but... Again, I would not have used that to give my opinion. I have to use the physical evidence in conjunction with the statement of Mr. Zimmer. The, you pointed out in your direct evidence that there were two lacerations on the back of Mr. Zimmerman's head and that you testified <clears throat> that you believed those two have been from separate impact. Yes, sir. Because you could see the sort of valley in between? Yes, sir. Those were the two blows that created the lacerations. Right, and in addition, they were so separate that if you impacted one, you couldn't get the other one. Mm -hmm. So there were two reasons. Your, your testimony was that was consistent with having Mr. Zimmerman's head struck at least twice on a surface like concrete. Objection is the leading nature of these questions. Setting the stage for the question. Well, but they're all still leading. You need to rephrase your questions. Is the, are the two lacerations with the valley in between on the back of Mr. Zimmerman's head consistent with at least two separate impacts on a surface like concrete? Yes, sir. And is it... I'm trying to figure out a way to ask you about tree branches. <laughs> and, uh, um, were there any big tree branches that you knew in the vicinity of where this happened that were on the ground that could have been used as a club? No. Oh, what you have is tree trunks, to be quite strictly uh -huh. speaking, but there's no tree branches that I could see. That's why when I first answered the question, I said there were no tree branches. So there for, aren't. for Mr. Zimmerman to have received those lacerations on the back of his head because of impact with a tree trunk, what would have had to have happened if, in fact, that were possible? It would practically have to be upright, sitting maybe because you're gonna to have to hit the trunk and you'd have to go back violently against the trunk on the two occasions so it would still be blunt trauma to the back of the head twice or it could have been from hitting his head on the sidewalk right argumentative. Well, overruled as to argumentative all over will is to leading. Please make sure you phrase your questions correctly. Sure. Is that scenario much more plausible and consistent with the physical evidence? The cement is more plausible. 
especially when you look at the side, the injuries on the side of the head, which wouldn't be tree trunk because you've got punctate, a pattern of punctate abrasions. You commented, of course, that there's a different role that some professionals play in dealing with someone that's been injured. Yes, sir. Whereas you may have a forensic approach, a treating doctor or PA may have a different objective. Now, their object, objective is to treat somebody. My objective is to document the injuries and interpret the injuries. And, you know, they don't care really, which is fine because their job is different than my job. And that's why they're pushing forensic nursing to put forensic nurses in emergency rooms and to document the injuries correctly because they're trained to do that. Uh, but nobody wants to spend the money. <laughs> you had an opportunity to review the physician assistant notes that Ms. Fulgate took the next day? Yes, sir. And did you notice in the notes that she documented what generally would be known as black eyes? Yes, sir. Is that consistent for something that shows up later after receiving a um, blow to the nose? It, 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 since it's secondary blackening of the eye, it's, it shows up later. If you punch the eye directly, it'll usually show up immediately. If you punch the nose, the blood generally leaks into the soft tissue of the eye. And so that shows up like the next day or a few hours later. It would not be surprising to you that someone who had sustained the blow to the nose that shown in the photos the night of February 26th, that there might be associated black eyes the next day? No, it wouldn't be surprising at all. Regarding the the issue of whether or not Mr. Zimmerman's nose was actually deviated or whether it just had some swelling that went down later. Is that significant in whether or not he got punched in the face? He'd still been punched in the face. Uh, the reason I say that there's a probable displaced fracture is the next photograph is spent is four hours later and that so-called swelling is gone which most likely represents the fact that the nose was displaced and now it's been put back into position. Within the range of medical possibilities, is it possible that maybe his nose wasn't deviated or if it was fractured, it wasn't deviated? Or d Does that matter in the sense of whether or not he got punched in the face? No, he's obviously been punched in the, in the nose and he's been hit in the forehead. That's the injuries up here you're talking about? Yes, sir. The GCS scale of 15, is that a reference to a paramedic note? Is that what that... No, uh, it's probably a check, uh, is an area on the form where, you know, a 15 means they're walking and talking and breathing and they got heart rate and they're not really bad. You know, once you start, most people who come into emergency rooms are 15s. Everybody in this courtroom is 15. To start going down, you have to start getting into trouble. No, I, I take it you're not claiming in some way that Mr. Zimmerman wasn't able to walk or talk that evening, um, notwithstanding his traumatic injuries. That's correct. What I'm saying is the type of injury he would get would be more of a stunning, not a, uh, what most people would think of as a significant concussion. That's why I tended to get away from the word concussion, and I went to the non-medical word, a mm -hmm. stunning type the, of injury. The idea of a concussion that may lead to subdural hematomas, may lead to death, is something that happens after, at some point in time, after the actual impact? Objection, again, leading. Please rephrase your question. Are the consequences of the blow those that develop over some period of time after the impact? Well, usually concussions show up immediately. But the problem is that's that they can be extremely subtle. 
And that's why sporting events like to have doctors there, because lay people will look at someone who's got a concussion and will not pick up anything unusual if it's a mild concussion. Mm -hmm. Of course, then as it gets more severe, then it becomes quite obvious. When you're getting hit like that, are you feeling it? Oh, yes. <laughs> are you in some appreciation that you're being injured? Yes. I mean, if you get punched in the nose, believe me, you know it. Does that continue to hurt for a while? Yes, sir. How about when you get your head banged on concrete? Does that hurt then and continue to hurt? Uh, it can very well, yes, especially if you've got lacerations. It hurt for a while, yes, sir. Would someone at that moment, when this is actually happening to them, be able to know whether or not what was happening to them was life-threatening? No, because they're stunned and, and you know, and you're in pain and you're in fear, so you, you can't interpret. Um, you, you, even, you know, looking at them outside, someone looking at them can say, oh, they, they're all right, but it happens all the time, you know, people, they think they're all right and then they die a few hours later. Mm -hmm. That's why the police in this case should have taken Mr. Zimmerman to a hospital, not to the police station. Because if he had died in the police station, they would have been sued, and the family would have won the lawsuit because he had head injuries, and that means you take him to the hospital. Even if there's not evidence of a concussion that he's stumbling or falling down or not able to talk? If you have had head injuries like that, you mm -hmm. go to an emergency room. Uh, you don't play around. If uh, some... I mean, it, people die in jail like that a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And With the jails this... always lose the lawsuits, I'm going to tell you that. Mm -hmm. So if someone is in the process of being hit and having their head struck on surface like cement, they're having this stunning effect and the pain associated with it. In the moment of that, not knowing when it's going to stop, are they able to say, I can take three more of these before I need to do something Chair, about it? Leading and argumentative. Same. Speculation. Under these circumstances with the trauma that you've seen in this case, would it be somewhat overwhelming to the person that's on the receiving end? Same objection. Well, you gave three objections last time, so which one of them is it? Leading and argumentative. Overruled as to both. Yes. There was some there were some questions about the packaging of the evidence, and especially if it's wet and has biological material on it. In this case, there's been testimony that the wet outer shirt in particular was sealed in a plastic bag while wet, and then placed in a paper bag on the outside of that. Is that consistent with good um, evidence handling? No, sir. There was also testimony that when the bag was opened, it smelled very strongly of mold and um, an ammonia type uh, yeah. odor. Because you, it's decomposing. That's why you don't. You air dry it and you put it in plastic and paper bags, not plastic, because you don't want the decomposition. Is it accepted forensic practice that subjecting evidence to that type of packaging? Now, you can also assume that it was in that condition for roughly a month, mm -hmm. that that would promote degradation or contribute to the likely degradation of the integrity of any DNA evidence on that clothing. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mr. Delarionda mentioned that if 
Trayvon Martin had put his hand over George Zimmerman's nose at this point in time when there was blood, that there may, may have been some transfer of blood to Mr. Martin's hands. That's what that question was getting at. Yes. And you think if Trayvon Martin had put his hand over George Zimmerman's nose and mouth when it was in this condition, is it your testimony that there may have been some transfer of blood to his hand? Yes, sir. I take it you would have no additional information as to whether or not Mr. Zimmerman's nose was actually bleeding at some point in time during the, um, uh, the incident. That's correct. I mean, you, you get an uh, impact to the nose. You'll eventually bleed, but I can't tell you if you're going to bleed immediately or not. just depends on what's and injured. Where that blood goes may depend on the position that your head is in. Yes, it does. Now, you've also talked quite a bit in direct about, I'm sorry, in, in cross, I guess, in direct, about if you find something that's important, but if you don't, the absence of finding it doesn't necessarily make the absence of evidence important. Right. That, that, that's a general uh, uh, fact that's understood. Absence doesn't mean anything. Presence does. Because especially if you don't know what the statistical probability that a thing is present is, you know, uh, uh, how often do you actually find something? like a, a transfer of DNA. How often does it occur? And you have to know that before you can even give a probability. If you haven't done that, you can't even get the, a given opinion. Do you agree that environmental conditions can affect whether or not DNA is present on physical evidence? Oh, yeah. For example, in this case, you can assume that it was about three hours from the event until Mr. Martin's body was transported. And during that time, while it may have been, the body may have been covered with a blanket or covering on the outside, um, there was a period of time when the body and his hands were exposed to the elements. Right, and, and then it's also how you enclose the body. Do you wrap it tightly or do you put it loose like, um, you know, Again, putting it in plastic containers, plastic tends to rub and be stiff. So, uh, you know, if it's there, it's significant for most things. If it's not there, it's usually not significant. You may also consider on that issue uh, that there's been testimony that the weather conditions varied from a light drizzle to a heavy rain during these events. And would the fact that it was raining to some degree could that also affect whether or not there's biological or DNA evidence collected from Mr. Martin's hands? That's true. And, and you know, um, or how the hands were handled and things like that. Or perhaps even if they may have been washed prior to being photographed? That's why the forensic pathologist is supposed to be with the body from the time it comes in. You should always be there. You should never leave the body, even if you have assistance helping you. You don't leave the body. You wouldn't trust your assistance to do, well, I, I guess what you're saying is while you may trust your assistance to follow the protocol, you would confirm and verify. Right. Like if you want them to, re if you want the clothing removed, you examine the clothing on the body before you say, okay, take it off. And then you stand there as they take it off to see if they're doing things appropriately and not maybe throwing it on the floor. You throw it on the floor, anything on the floor is now on the clothing. And then you have it put on a tray, but you don't have the clothing piled on top of each other because if there's some material on one piece of clothing and you put the other piece of clothing on top of it, you can get transferred. So you're supposed to be monitoring this the whole time. Let me show you, uh, doctor, what's marked as State's Exhibit 28, 
which has been offered into evidence Objection as beyond the scope of cross-examination. I, I don't know what it is. I'll ask the question. The, the, the state's exhibit 28 has been offered into evidence and it represents a picture of Mr. Martin's chest taken at the scene by the crime scene technician. And then I'd like to show you state's exhibit 95, which is uh, in evidence and has been represented as a photograph taken at the time of the autopsy, but before any cleaning or washing was done to the body. If you'll please approach and show the pictures to the court. Five D. Yes, you may. State's exhibit twenty-eight was taken at the scene. And if you would note whether there's any blood present in that photograph. Yes, there's some blood around the nipple. And if you would look at State's Exhibit 95, which was represented as being taken at the time of the autopsy, but before the body was cleaned. Do you see any blood in that picture? No. In the original photo, there's a stream of blood running down from the nipple, down from the wound to the nipple, and that's missing in this photograph. Evidently, someone cleaned it. Yeah, it's been cleaned. Question as to argumentative and speculation. Sustained as to speculation. I ruled as to argumentative. Thank Last two photographs that were shown. Yes. Do you remember what the ones that were shown? What yeah, that's the. the scene? I'm sorry, what? I apologize. May I approach a witness, Your Honor? Yeah, the, the gunshot wound. One taken at the scene, allegedly. One taken at, at the scene, State's Exhibit 28. Doesn't that show that the sweatshirt is up? <clears throat> yeah, but it's, it's been pulled up. Right. And if it's at the scene while they're transporting the body and the body comes to the medical examiner's office with their sweatshirt down, wouldn't that absorb the blood there? Uh, may I see the other photograph? Sure. Well, since it's not here, it's been removed, so it's been pulled off. So it, if you're asking me, could it have wiped the blood up as it was being pulled off? Sure. In other words, the, you would expect the blood in the sweatshirt, correct? Right. Now, you were asked a, a bunch of questions by Mr. Uh, West. You agree that Mr. West testifying is not evidence, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And would you use Mr. West's statements to form your opinion? No, sir. I use the autopsy report and the, um, the laboratory reports to form and, my opinion. And the autopsy report, that was the one that you mentioned prepared by Dr. Bell, correct? Right. And the photographs plus the uh, uh, firearms report uh, to form my opinion. Yes, sir. And you agree there was, there was an absence of any x-rays or other actual proof of a broken nose, correct? That's correct, sir. And you agree that there was absence of documentation of any kind of concussion or brain injury or brain bleeding, correct? Oh, yes, sir. And you agree that there was absence of any proof of anything being washed off the victim's body? I can't say whether it was washed or not. Uh, what I said was is that if, they, if that shirt was lying on the end, they pulled it off. I could have wiped off some of the blood, and that's why you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> you're supposed to take the photograph before, uh, of the wound intact before you clean it. And so there was a big no-no there okay. either way. Are you saying that at the scene, the medical examiner personnel should remove the clothing of the victim, or should the, vic the clothing remain this on the victim until he's transported to the uh, ME's office? No, what I'm saying is, is that 
the, the clothing should remain on the body, so the photograph taken at the scene, that's proper. But when they got to the medical examiner's office, they shouldn't have pulled, the, if they wanted photographs of the scene as received, they shouldn't have undressed the body or pulled anything off because they would be wiping it. And then the rest of the, but the, the whole chest is clean and, and such. So, um, you know, it's, it, the, the techniques weren't exactly correct, let's put it that way. But, but you did rely on Dr. Bauhaus' report in terms of his findings, correct? That's, I had no other choice, sir. Okay. And, and based on your observations of the photographs, they document what occurred in terms oh, of right, that, right? right. Yeah, You're not disputing that. Right, the, the, the photographs of the wound were the best thing. Okay. Do you have absence, is there any absence of evidence that uh, anything was washed by the rain? Uh, it would have to be, uh, you have to know how much is raining there and you'd have to have an observation. Pure it could be washed away by the rain. Pure speculation, correct? Yeah, unless you were there and saw how much it was washed. Okay. And uh, there was there was an absence of vomiting, or, right? You didn't see any vomiting out there, correct? Right. And finally, you were asked about uh, John Good, what he testified. Do you agree that a jury that heard John Good's testimony should rely on what he said on the witness stand? Correct? And what, here's what I'm getting at. It's kind of interesting. If he's got a good statement at the time and then he testifies something else on the witness stand, you begin to wonder. Okay. You know, I mean, I think that's up for the jury to consider. Right. My, my question is, if John Good testified and either saw nor heard any blows landing and either saw nor heard anything being slammed on the sidewalk, does the physical evidence, is that what then you rely on? No, I wouldn't. I tell you, I didn't rely anything on his statement. Oh, you, you completely disregarded John Good. No, no, I, I, I disregarded the witnesses because the problem basic, what I was trying to do was essentially take Mr. Zimmerman's statement and see whether the physical evidence uh, was in, um, supported it or uh, invalidated his statement. So, because the witnesses, you know, they're all over the place. You right. can't use the witnesses okay. to make autopsy decisions. But but isn't what George Zimmerman, a defendant, is relaying to the police, isn't he affect a witness in terms of what happened? Yes. Okay. But that's why you don't believe him and you do the tests and look at the autopsy to check what he said matches what you find at the body. Right. And, and, and what you did is you relied on one of his statements and what, the bottom line is what you can say is the gun was out and it was two inches from the body. Two to four two, inches sorry, from the body. Two to four body. inches, right. correct? Thank you. Right. One, one very narrow area. On this notion of the absence of evidence not being evidence of absence no, notion, um, if Mr. Good didn't testify that he heard George Zimmerman's head hitting cement like this in some way, does that in any way mean that Mr. Zimmerman's head didn't actually get hit on the cement? No. Same thing, if Mr. Good didn't hear Trayvon Martin hit George Zimmerman in the head like this, does that mean George Zimmerman didn't get hit in the head to cause the injuries that you saw? No. Thank you. Thank you. May Dr. DeMaio be excused? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. West, may Dr. DeMaio be excused? Okay, thank you very much, Doctor. You're excused. Call your next witness, please. Um, your next witness is? I'm sorry, Your Honor. One moment. Sorry for the delay. And his first name is? Okay, we'll ask him when he gets on the stand. <laughs> 